It's been a challenge, but it's not been something that I can't get over and cope with. I've kind of done that for my whole life and just moved on and got on with it. He's grown stronger, I think, from it, and it just shows that he won't stop at anything. He's always been quite confident, and because of that, people sort of instantly fall in love with him. He's not let anything, anything stand in his way, really. All I remember is walking upstairs and I can just remember the, the steps and that's it. Um, and I was found with something around my neck and mum ran upstairs and basically found me hanging, if you like, um, and something was around my neck, my heart stopped. So she cut me down and um, did the CPR and then they, she called the ambulance. They got there really, really quickly and did the defibrillator um, on my chest and the electric shock. I was sat down here while the paramedics were working upstairs and I was really panicking that he wasn't going to come back at all. And then I, one of the paramedics was sat with me and she said, I'll go and find out. And she came back down again and said, they still haven't got him started yet. And that was, it felt like ages. So it was, that was really hard. My neighbour was sat with me as well and she yeah, was yeah, tearful as well. So we were both really concerned. Still hard to talk about even now really. Um, I was at work when it happened um, and I'd got home. Um, the neighbour had been at the station with the police, um, policeman to sort of make sure that they spotted me and brought me back. But I, I totally missed them, totally walked past them. So by the time I got down the end of the road here, there was blue lights flashing everything, and then suddenly someone shouted out, that's his dad over there. And I thought, my God, what's, what have I done? <laughs> or what's Peter done? And of course, when I walked in the house and they told us what had happened, it was absolutely shocking. And the next thing we knew, they sped us in the police car up to the hospital, and then they brought Peter in, and that's the first time I'd seen him. And, I think I saw Celia and she looked at, like she aged about 20 years in that short, short space of time. And then we heard that they'd started his heart again. So it was, it was, initially it was like, just want him back, I just want him back, I want to be able to talk to him. And then it was, I want him to be the same as he was before. It was, well, thanks to mum that I'm still here today and able to kind of learn about disability sports and try and push that out now. Peter was in a coma for a whole week. They, they induced you into a coma. And um, it, it was like some, it was just like, you, could, you couldn't imagine it was really happening. It was just like it was a little dream world. And we'd sit there in the mornings, sort of have a coffee and just think, right, what are we gonna do today? What are we gonna do? And all we could do is really go in, and the machines were keeping them alive and everything. So it was pretty much dependent on that. You could sort of speak to him and there was the, the chance that he would be able to hear it at that time. But yeah, it obviously wasn't reacting to anything. So, so yeah, it was, a bit of a, it was a bit of a whirlwind, I don't know, four hours I'd say. I was probably, I was probably up at uni in Sheffield and then four hours later down in St George's Hospital uh, next, next to his, his bed. At one point on the monitor, there's this, goes <laughs> like this, and at one point there was a shadow on on the monitor and it, it kind of did this together and dad went oh my god what ha what's happened is he okay is he okay and said, oh, no, that's, that's a good thing that he's trying to breathe for himself and dad always says that it was that point that he realized that oh actually he might be okay and th you know, things were looking positive even within that week of torment for them probably after a week they tried to bring him out of the coma and it didn't work, so I had to put him again under for another 24 hours. And then when, they, when the doctors tried to bring him out again the next day, and he sort of put a finger up to Peter and he said, can you touch my finger? And Peter went like that and touched his finger. It was the most amazing thing, because you know, we didn't know what we'd end up with. That was probably where it was the most emotional, really, because it was the first time you actually saw that there was 
there was any kind of, um, I don't know, recognition from him and uh, any, any kind of response from him really because it had just been him lying in a bed for, for several days. Once he'd started breathing on his own, they brought in, because they knew he was a football fan, they brought in match of the day or in, early in the morning, so it was a repeat, so it must have been Sunday morning, they brought him um, so that he could watch match of the day and he was just lying there and as soon as the match of the day signature tune went on, he sat up. <laughs> I remember that. And then he sat and watched this match, but there was no reaction to anything, I remember. So when people scored, didn't react, he just was watching it. So I, that was quite hard to cope with because I thought he would normally be obviously really or be commenting or be really excited. It took about a month for me to get back to being able to be on my feet, to be able to do things a bit more independently that you'd expect a five-year-old child to do. We just saw him go from strength to strength over the next sort of few months really. And that was literally we had to teach him to eat, walk, talk, drink, everything from scratch. But he just remembered so much and then I like, walked on his knees and then eventually he was on his feet. And I remember him trying to run down the corridor in Kingston Hospital and he sort of bounced off the walls and his brother was in tears. It was just amazing. It all looked like it was great. He looked like he had recovered and hadn't actually had any injuries at all, you know, didn't suffer at all for a little while. And then I remember he went running and I was watching him run and thinking, hang on a minute, because he was just not putting one arm, one arm was just up and he wasn't moving it at all. And he said he felt like he was running normally. So then we realised, oh, actually there are some um, side effects from this. After making a very promising recovery, Peter wanted to return to the one thing he had a real passion for, football. <laughs> so I tried to go back to my local team, Brooklands, and tried to play for the A team, and tried to go back to Pro Directs and play for their academy again, and realised quite quickly that I was nowhere near the standard that I was, because I now had this disability, where one side of my body is more affected, so my left side of my body is more affected, and I run with a limp and I've got um, something called an associated reaction where my arm seizes up uh, and yeah, it's just more to contend with really. It was quite sad because one day he turned around to me and said, Dad, I'm, I'm not going to try football again because he'd, he tried to play football again but the pace wasn't there. There was loads of things that were missing and, and he realised he couldn't do it like he used to the same level and wanted to give up and then I just said to him, well, there might be other options and that's when we started ringing around, got hold of Chelsea and they said I'll bring him along but we've already got a team for the year. And they, I took him along and then they signed him up there and then they thought it was really good so what can I say? Peter played for Chelsea's disability team for five years, one of the highlights being when he captained the side out to Barcelona. However, his time at Chelsea wasn't entirely positive as he recalls. We went and played on the opening match of Rapid Vienna um, and we played before the main Chelsea team in front of I think it was about 20,000 plus fans. Uh, it, it was an amazing day, one that I'll never forget. Now we then came home later in, in the week and looked at the newspaper and it said John Terry plays in Rapid Vienna's opening match and all these amazing players you know played in the opening matches nothing about disability football again partly why I want to try and raise the coverage of disability sports but it, it, it was a kind of wake-up call that no one really cares and it's a sad thing but no one really cares about disability sport which is why I'm so passionate about trying to push it because being in that place about you know, trying to play the sport and trying to get the recognition we deserve and getting nothing from it was, um, yeah, sad. And from that, we then, I've then come back and created my own campaign called Why Can't We to try and raise the awareness of disability sports. And I'm now using that to push stories about disability sports, both in local news, national news, international news, um, and trying to get as much awareness out there for people to look at because if there is another Peter Harding somewhere who has just had a brain injury and is worried that sport's going to go forever they can go well no there's actually a lot of sport out there for me. Come on, come on. 
Move out wide for him again. Move out wide. Show for him. Good. And again. Good. Great. Cosmos. Good. Good. Although Peter's return to playing football was more difficult than he expected, coaching, on the other hand, significantly helped him in overcoming his disability, and he feels it can help others in the same way. In terms of my own disabilities, uh, there's been a lot of challenges, but I think coaching has definitely helped, and it's given me a lot more confidence and given me a lot more drive to succeed. At the moment, there's not enough done around disability sports events, especially with how many people probably want to get active. The more it does happen, the more people will find out about it, the more people will get to grips with what disability is and how to coach and how to play football. And just it improves everything. It's society as a whole. Getting to know more about disability and disability sports is a massive thing. And the more these happen, the bigger the competition, the better the players, the everything. More coverage. Jamie, start out wide and then go in as the ball goes in. You can stay out here if you want to, yeah. Try and hit the back post. Jordan, same again on the edge. Screen. Joe. As a result of the time Peter spent coaching his local disability side, Wongas, as well as AFC Wimbledon's Down Syndrome girls team, he was awarded with a commendation of the highest accolade by the FA. Well, right, guys, shake hands, let's shake hands. My proudest moment was in 2016 when I was awarded the Young Volunteer of the Year Award uh, by the FA. The league that I was also sitting on their board for um, also won the um, Best League of the Year. Uh, so it was great because it again pushed disability forward and said how you know, there's a disability league for football, there's this disability football league coach. In, my, in terms of me, which is great. Um, on the day, I went to Wembley and I was awarded this on the pitch by Jeff Hurst. Uh, and inside is some of the, uh, the grass from, uh, from Wembley. It was him who spotted it as we were walking along to the Wembley. He went, oh look, and it was his name up in lights. And there was videos of him that they'd already pre the FA had filmed beforehand, um, all up on the screen. And I was going, "Oh my God, Mum, Dad, look!" And just to this day, again, I shocked that that was even there. Just the whole thing, the whole day was just amazing. It was just very big. Um, Jackie Oakley, the presenter, she sort of came up to him after because she hosted it, and she said to Peter, she said. There, there was no you know, worry about choosing you because you just stood out from everyone. I think it was just the whole day was really impressive that he got he got the awards and then, but then also just yeah his ability to just go and speak to anyone and tell people about what had happened to him and yeah I think that's probably what's got him a long way really with with a lot of the stuff that he's done since. As a parent, you just wonder what he's going to do next. To be honest, <laughs> you never know. But I think that was definitely a defining moment. That was really, really good. At the age of 20, Peter made the brave decision to move away from his home in Surrey and move up to Manchester in pursuit of his dream career by taking a job at the BBC. Peter was showing no signs of his disability holding him back. The fact that I've got the disability, I, I try not to draw attention to that. It's part of my life and I'm happy to you know, I'm a disabled person and that's fine with me. But the fact that I am disabled doesn't define me and doesn't make me, it doesn't say that actually I'm disabled so therefore I have to be treated differently or with any more needs or more respect or whatever else. Yes, okay, occasionally there's times that I do need more help, but it's not always. Um, so I hope if my colleagues were talking about me, they'd say, oh, it's just Peter. and. Um, it's good at his work and yeah, nothing, nothing unusual. But then the other thing is that I do a lot of work around disability sports. So a lot of my time in BBC Sport was, push, was pushing disability sport on the agenda, saying, please get it out there and please broadcast it. So for example, there's a clip for the, there's a clip for the Amputee World Cup 
that I did. Um, that I came up with this idea, put it forward to get inspired, and they then used it. Five Live then got on board, Sports News got on board, and it, I think The Last Leg as well did a feature on it. And it kind of blossomed from that, which was fantastic for me. So I'd like to say that people would think that I'm quite passionate about disability sports and that I'm quite a passionate person, but I, who knows what they'd say. I'm sure a lot of rude things. <laughs> Discrimination is quite a hard thing to talk about because it, it, it's so big and there's so many people that are discriminated against in loads of different ways, whether it be the sexuality, the age gaps, or disability, kind of you name it and there's always a there's always a way that someone can discriminate um, and I think it can only get better with the more education that goes on through people like Kick It Out and just schools and education in general really. Peter's accident in 2012 was undoubtedly life-changing, but certainly not life-stopping. With every barrier he has broken down, Peter and everyone around him have learned a huge amount about disability, society and humanity in general. I think the, the one thing I've learned the most is that you've just got to carry on and you've just got to find ways of adapting you can still achieve anything. I mean, I always knew that, but I think you, it made me focus even more, actually, whatever little step you can make, somebody who's got real profound multiple learning difficulties, if you can just focus on a really small step for them and they achieve it, it means a huge amount for yeah, their parents. It will be a huge amount for them if they, can, if they can do something, a little something. So I think that's, it's little steps and see where you get to. In terms of sport and just life in general, it's more of a determination that things will happen if I push myself. Um, but until I do that, the disabilities will get the better of me. And therefore, you know, what's the point of living? <laughs> you just suddenly understood their needs and, you know, how to talk to them as well, you know, because it's a different approach altogether. It's so easy to upset someone if by saying the wrong thing, but you just, and they're, they're just such lovely kids, you know. People with disabilities in, in general and the, the problems they face in everyday life outside of sport, um, yeah, I think it's just probably opened my eyes a lot more to, to all those sort of, those different elements. If you let things get too big and overwhelming, then, then it can only go downhill. So I just thought, right, I've got my disability, come to terms with that and just get on with it. So in terms of learning, about myself, I think I've learned that I'm quite resilient in that way. Um, and I think also people are getting better at being more understanding about disability. And in terms of my family, obviously trying to get to learn things that are different for them, obviously is a lot of things they can see. And they've been able to adapt to my disability quite well. It doesn't matter that they've got disabilities at all, you know. They're their children at the end of the day. And um, that's lovely. And I think that's what Peter sees, you know, he sort of sees, OK, so they've got a disability, but what's to stop them from playing football? I want to sort of make them a better footballer. I want them to enjoy it more. And that's sort of, another, again, another driver for him. So, I mean, I have learnt a lot. I've learnt a lot about disabilities. It's quite an amazing thing that a lot of people don't understand disability and they don't understand how it affects people. But equally, they do and they understand that they need to be more supportive and it's been, it's been interesting to see uh, how people react to disability. Don't ever give up hope I think is the, yeah that's the biggest thing. See you later on. <laughs> I'm going to put you off. It's alright, see you soon. Bye. I'll see you next time. Love you lot. You too. See you, Pete. See you later on. Let's do his business.